Um, we might kick off, guys, just conscious, obviously, of time and getting through everything. Um, so, look, welcome, everybody. Um, it's great to have, have people on here remotely, uh, a little bit of a different approach to things, as we know in our world today. Um, so, look, I'd just like to welcome everybody. Um, today, myself and my colleague, Vanessa, will be covering, I suppose, just a, a, br a run through um, regarding market information, I suppose what we're currently seeing uh, on the market, especially across Munster and Ireland in general. And then my colleague Vanessa will take over and run through preparing for remote interviews. Um, so just to, to kick things off here and to introduce myself, uh, my name is Louise O'Neill. I am team lead here on the permanent and contract team for um, Business and Technology Desk. Um, I have four years of, of recruitment on the technical um, market in Cork, so I have predominantly worked on the IT sport, infrastructure and security space. Um, so I'm delighted to, to speak with you all today and just give you, I suppose, a little bit of insight into how the market's looking and what we're hearing. And, and look, there's certainly an awful lot of positive things ongoing, um, despite obviously the current pandemic and everything. Um, I think Cork is really coming out in, in, in the front in terms of jobs and opportunities that, that we do currently have. Um, and then my colleague Vanessa will take over and uh, she will discuss remote interviewing and give some tips and tricks. Um, I'd also like to, to take the opportunity to welcome Eric, our guest speaker. Um, so Eric, thank you very much for, for your time today. It's great to have you here as well. Um, to introduce Eric, um, Eric's Senior Business Development Manager with LabSkin. Um, he joined, uh, I suppose, LabSkin there, um, which are a human skin model lab, if I'm saying that correctly, uh, back in July 2019. Um, so LabSkin, due to the pandemic, have become a fully remote company. Uh, so they've changed their business model, which is why we felt Eric would be, I suppose, very, very relevant to have on the call here today uh, to, to run through some remote interviewing tips and tricks with us as well. Um, so Eric has joined the team there and he's obviously looking now to uh, promote his own profile as well across the Labskin, uh, I suppose, brand um, home and abroad. So to get things started, um, I suppose overall, guys, look, we started 2020 on a very positive note. Um, Cork has really set itself up, um, as has Ireland in, in general, as a real place to work and live. Uh, we were really, I suppose, driving on in terms of um, being, you know, a very strong country in terms of employability um, and opportunity across the board. Um, so our unemployment rate in Ireland prior to, to COVID had actually dipped to under 5%, which was the first time since the financial crisis of 2008. So according to the Chartered Accountancy Ireland website, Ireland's labour market was essentially at full employment. So simply speaking, there was a job available for anybody that was seeking one on the market. Um, we did have challenges last year with Brexit. Um, it was certainly, I suppose, a point of causing a lot of uncertainty for companies. Um, but I suppose look, there was a lot of positivity coming towards Ireland due to Brexit with a lot of multinationals looking at Ireland um, and Cork in particular, as a real safe haven for 2020. Um, we have got a very good ranking in terms of, I suppose, our digital quality of life. So that has supported us with the move to remote working as well. Uh, we have been ranked 28th um, across 85 countries in Europe, um, which means basically that our broadband and our mobile speeds are very good and efficiently capable of supporting us to work from home. So, while COVID has caused a number of issues for us globally, um, we are probably looking at facing maybe a, a short recession, um, hopefully nothing too extreme. Um, we are keeping things very positive here at Leaside, I suppose, in terms of our key employers, um, like across the pharma, fintech, IT and R&D sectors we are continuously seeing companies coming here, advancing with their plans and continuing to hire across Cork. Um, uh, there have been, I suppose, a good rise in terms of, of companies adopting this remote work from home, um, remote slash work from home opportunities. So the majority of companies across Ireland are really starting to adapt their way of working. And we're seeing that then become trust and empowerment of staff to really do their jobs from anywhere. So a lot of positivity on that front. Um, I suppose just to highlight, 
you know, with a lot of, I suppose, negative press uh, going around with COVID and job losses, you know, we have seen a, a significant amount of mass companies coming to Ireland and Cork in particular to set up and really, I suppose, set themselves up in terms of hiring and opportunities. So, you know, we have the likes of Amazon up in the airport business park here who have announced over a thousand jobs to be spread across Cork and Dublin. TikTok have decided to come to Ireland instead of the UK and you set up a data center here. We have Gilead who are massively hiring in, in Cork and Dublin. Global Shares is another company that's massively hiring across Cork and Clannacilty. So that remote work-life balance would be, you know, another possibility being down West Cork. We have Stryker who are kind of coming in at a different level in terms of hiring more senior staff. Uh, J&J, again, they're ramping up with their hiring. Um, any roles they did have active prior to COVID went on hold. They didn't lose those roles. So it's great to see them back open and hiring again, you know, very aggressively. Service now coming to set up another data center in Dublin, which is again due to Brexit. Um, and Remitly, another company, are massively hiring in Cork City. So they're coming to one of the new spaces in the city there um, from a financial standpoint and a, a financial payments company. And they're really ramping up their hiring too. So, you know, an awful lot of positivity. Cadence, another massive tech company coming into Cork, and they're rapidly expanding and hiring. Work Vivo. Uh, it's great to see John Goulding and the team there really getting out in the forefront in terms of their communications platform. Um, it's something that a lot of companies are putting an awful lot of money and I suppose investment into to see that their, their staff are communicating and I suppose keeping active online as much as possible. Um, we also have Solo Energy. They're bringing 20 jobs to Cork just across IT alone. Um, and then you have your other key, key employers, you know, you have Apple, Client Solutions, Logitech, Malware Bytes, MSD, Unlock Systems, PGI, Red Hat, Tyndall and Veronis. All massive companies in Cork that really are still out there hiring and bringing an awful lot of positivity to the jobs market in Cork. Um, so look, you know, we do work with a number of these companies and we'd be happy to give any additional information to anyone on the call there who might be wondering about any specific companies. Our details will all be up at the end of these slides. So we'd be more than happy to answer any questions that you might have with regards to any of those employers. Um, and outside of the real capital, um, looking at, I suppose, the sunny southeast, it's great to see the likes of Eurofins, um, the HSE are really ramping up hiring down in the southeast. We have MTech Mobility, Nearform, Teva, UPMC, and West Pharmaceuticals are all really focused on hiring down in the, in the southeast. So, you know, a lot, of, a lot of very good positivity coming there. Um, I suppose overall what we are seeing on the market is a number of companies really rolling out how they're um, adjusting to COVID. So, you know, instead of companies, I suppose, coming in, I suppose, not rolling in with it, we are seeing, you know, the real leaders in the market, you know, Siemens, are rolling out a mobile working environment, so two, three days a week remote, even post-COVID, and that will be their plan. We've seen the likes of Google, Facebook, and Uber all working remotely until next year. So they're really giving, I suppose, people their, their forward planning uh, and giving the support there to all of their, um, I suppose, employees across the globe to work remotely and stay as safe as possible while doing so. Um, I suppose just to give some insight on the key areas that we're really seeing ramping up and, and what we feel is going to become, um, you know, real focus points following COVID. And, and this is even prior to COVID as well. IT security is, is without a doubt one of the real emerging spaces. And, um, you know, we've seen a massive ramp up in this area in Cork alone over the last 18, 24 months. Um, so, you know, we are going to see double, uh, double those job figures across Cork alone over the next 10 years. So we are kind of becoming a real security hub, uh, which is excellent for Cork. Uh, you know, we've got the university and the, the IT, the Institute of Technology, really supporting that line of, uh, I suppose, work with their cybersecurity masters and their courses. So we are seeing some excellent quality really coming out of those courses and taking the forefront in terms of the opportunities with jobs across Cork in particular. Um, software development, look, Ireland is the second largest software uh, exporter, you know, globally. So it's great to see that we are still just as busy as ever. Uh, companies are advancing their technologies. Um, I suppose all applications, we're probably seeing a lot of stuff 
advancing on that front. Um, and the gaming industry, of course, is really booming. Uh, everyone's at home and has a few extra hours uh, to, to play. So we're really seeing a ramp up in those areas as well. Um, and then data and, and AI in general is, is really a massive market that's becoming you know, bigger and bigger. We're all functioning off of data. Um, you know, it, it's going to become one of the biggest areas, I, I think, in the coming years, where, you know, right now, Skillset Ireland is estimating that there will be between 49 and 62,000 big data and data analytic roles, you know, by 2020 in Ireland. So there is a lot coming on that front as well. Um, so just to Eric, I'm, I'm going to pop a question in your direction there. Um, sure. I suppose you are very active on the market and, and you know, obviously hiring as well. Like, have, what have you seen in the market in terms of, I suppose, current trends for you guys? You know, would, would it, I suppose, match what I'm saying or how, how have you seen the market change? Yeah, I think, I think the one thing that's probably um, a little bit missing, and I, I think it's, it's, it's missing for a reason, is, the, is actually cosmetics and um, data-driven cosmetics. Um, yeah. So, I spoke to a woman from Unilever in San Diego last year and I asked her like what's the biggest driver in terms of cosmetics at the moment and she said technology and, and the use of you know, for example AI and machine learning to, to basically leap forward in being able to, to crunch the level of data associated with cosmetics you know so that, that's the biggest trend I've noticed there's a company called Cosmetic Creations they're on Blackpool um, and they used to be the old Yves Rocher plant uh, so they've taken over that big plant and they're looking to set up essentially a cosmetics hub uh, in, in Cork, which is which is very exciting. Yeah. Um, and a lot of a lot of the cosmetics companies now, because of the regulations uh, in the EU, um, they're looking to test their products effectively and, and using data and using software uh, is a big part of it. So that's why I say that would be the biggest trend that I've seen yeah. so far uh, in my particular line of work. Yeah ties in there the data and AI side of things is exactly, obviously yeah, yeah. just becoming more and more definitely yeah um, brilliant thanks for that Eric um, so just moving on I suppose the key motivators we're seeing as we're talking to candidates all the time um, most candidates active on the market um, are typically looking for the right move um, majority of people you know finding themselves I suppose in a situation where maybe their company isn't performing as well or maybe they are a little bit concerned you know, they're not just jumping ship for anything. Um, it really is about the opportunity for people now. And they really want to see, you know, I suppose, overall opportunity within companies. Um, so like a recent survey done by Irish Jobs has indicated that employees are no longer really attracted to fancy novel work, per workplace perks. And um, it just doesn't, doesn't add the value for them anymore. And um, what we are seeing though is, is that company culture and strong organizational values are really key um, for job seekers these days. Um, the survey does also indicate that young professionals really value the future earning potential and opportunities within a company, whereas more senior professionals are more interested in, I suppose, you know, their full earning potential as of now, and I suppose their leadership aspirations. So just a slight difference, I suppose, which is pretty expected on the market, really, from, from the, the suppose, more junior through to the more senior candidates. Um, in general, we are seeing candidates look at the overall package, though. So while salary, of course, is one of the, the key areas that people, you know, we all have bills to pay. So that is, of course, one of the most important areas. Um, company, people are really looking at a company, um, especially on the tech side of things. You know, candidates want to know what technologies a company is going to be working with um, and, you know, I suppose what they're planning on implementing further down the line. You know, so will they get exposure to some of the newest and greatest technologies out there or might they be a little bit behind? Um, so it really is, I suppose, about being in the forefront of technology for a lot of candidates. Um, and adding to this then that real professional development is, is very, very important for the majority of people. Um, work-life balance, um, if anything, COVID has certainly uh, made people realise that that work-life balance, that extra hour you get back from maybe not being in the car on a commute to and from work is very, very important. Um, I know for a fact it's the first question I get asked by candidates Will there be flexibility? Will there be remote work? 
So, you know, it is definitely one of the biggest things and, and it could be a challenge for some companies, you know, like Eric, I know you said, obviously you have people in labs and things like that, that, you know, it might not be feasible for those people to actually work fully remotely, but some element of flexibility is certainly what most people are aiming to see nowadays, especially um, with the realization of how much time we all get back now uh, with the remote work. So very, very important. Um, and then lastly, I suppose, Benefits packages in general, you know, most companies nowadays do offer a good benefits package and um, that may be made up, you know, of a bonus structure, healthcare, pension, and um, it is really a tipping point for a lot of candidates. You know, they may be looking at, okay, uh, a good salary in one company, but there's no benefits. They may actually reconsider, you know, their salary baseline if there's going to be additional benefits in terms of bonus structure. Uh, at that pension, healthcare, it really is about that overall package now for people. So it's very, very important, I suppose, that companies, you know, assess that and, and realise it. Um, and even the support for, let's just say, working from home. Can you help your staff get set up? Um, I'm sure a lot of companies have done that recently anyway. But it is something, you know, for, for companies maybe coming to Cork to set up um, that they can consider because it is really, I suppose, a good support for candidates getting set up. Um, so Eric, I'm going to pop another question in your direction and then I'm going to hand over to Vanessa. Um, so I suppose from maybe your view on the candidate market, have you seen, I suppose, any changes in candidate requirements? You know, any, I suppose, um, real change, like obviously the work from home. Have you seen that coming through in any candidates that you may have been interviewing with or maybe speaking with more recently? Yeah, I, think, I mean, in general, I think it's, it's been pretty... Pretty much the same however things like uh, as you mentioned like health benefits now i think candidates are a lot more aware of these things because it's become highlighted in recent times um i think certainly when i left university i didn't think of health insurance or pension or, or these types of things so i think they're they're a lot more aware about the what i would call the hard benefits um and i think there were in the past maybe some companies had a tendency to have a lot of soft benefits like you know a foosball table or a, you yeah. know, a, play, a play pen or, or whatever they had and I think um, I think that now is becoming less relevant and yeah. I think people are a lot more serious about their, their benefits and, yeah. and how they'll survive basically. Yeah the ping pong tables don't cut it anymore unfortunately. Oh, unfortunately not. <laughs> yeah and um, so guys I'm just popping my details up here I'm more than happy to connect with on LinkedIn or if you want to give me a buzz here on my mobiles up there or you can call the office line at any stage here uh, to have a chat with us in Berkeley about I suppose the market uh, and just to reiterate anything else that I just uh, spoke about if you have any specific questions please don't hesitate to get in touch. Um, so I'm going to pass you over to Vanessa um, and Vanessa is going to take the second part of the presentation here. So I'm just going to stop sharing. Okay. Guys, we'll get to questions then afterwards if that's okay, because I can see there's a few popping in there. But I'm just going to let Vanessa take over there. Okay, just give me a second. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay, brilliant. Uh, uh, apologies for that. Okay, okay, perfect. So thanks very much for that, Louise. And thank you guys for tuning in. I hope you're enjoying our webinar so far. So uh, I'm Vanessa and exactly on this day, two years ago, uh, I joined Berkeley as a sourcer, straight after I graduated from Michael Smurfett and handed in my uh, master thesis in human resource management. Then I became a recruitment consultant and now I am a team lead on a permanent site um, on business and technology division here in Berkeley. So basically today we're going to uh, talk about remote interviewing. So I know that while there are some tips uh, common to all interview preparation, like knowing your strengths and weaknesses, the reasons why you would like to join a particular company and so on, preparing for a remote job interview requires you to take a few unique steps uh, to ensure you make the best impression possible. So I'll just give you a quick, um, quick brief of what you can do in order to be prepared for it. Um, so first of all, make sure that you are set up properly. So if you are preparing for a webcam interview, you should take into consideration your lighting. Uh, avoid any harsh lighting behind you as this will turn you into a shadowy silhouette. 
and instead try to have some natural light in front of you, but do not sit right in front of your window either. You want your interviewers to see and remember your face. Uh, and also, please don't forget about the background as well. Try to keep it plain and simple so the interviewer will not be distracted. And in addition, just ensure you won't be interrupted by a family member, housemate, pets, or simply by any external noise. And so I would advise switching off alerts and chats during the interview and making sure that everyone is aware that you are not available during that specific hour. Um, oh, apologies for that, guys. Oh, some little technical difficulties here. Okay, brilliant. Um, so once you're set up, um, once your setup is prepared, I would also conduct a technical trial and uh, run of your video conferencing platform, preferably two days in advance. Check your computer camera, microphone, and internet connection, because believe it or not, poor internet connection can not only affect the interview itself, but also the company's final decision regarding your application, especially if the job you're interviewing for can be done remotely. Um, I've had a situation when a hiring manager called me and, and suggested that my candidate simply won't be able to do the job because of the incorrect working environment he was in. But other than that, everything was perfect. He had the correct skill set and correct background, but just the environment wasn't, wasn't the best for him, so he got regretted. So please do not forget to prepare your setup and conduct the test run because the devil really can be in the detail. Um, also, have the interviewer's email and phone number ready in case of any potential technical difficulties. And if it's a recruiter representing you, just make sure that he or she will be available during, during your interview time, just in case if you would experience any difficulties. So another thing that I would like to highlight is your attire. Uh, remember to still dress up professionally and trust me, you don't want to just put a shirt and a tie on and comfortably sit in your boxer briefs in your room because that may end up badly. Uh, I've seen plenty of uncomfortable videos going viral uh, from times when people forgot to dress up appropriately. So please do not just dress up, dress up um, the top half of yourself because you never know. You may need to get up at some stage. Um, and then most of all, do your homework and be prepared. So do your research on the company, know their products, services, plans, and culture, which actually plays a significant part in your preparation for the interview. So it's important to understand ahead of time if the company culture is one where people are receptive to new ideas. So I would advise to ask yourself a question, is the company I'm interviewing for um, known for inclusion and open-mindedness, or do they have a slow-moving legacy mindset? Or does the leadership team encourage open communication and innovation or not really? So knowing the answers to these questions can hugely help you in your interview or even your final decision if you would receive an offer. So I believe websites like Glassdoor, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Reddit can help you answer these questions. Or if a recruiter is representing you, just ask him or ask her. Just use us as, as much as you can because we can be a pretty good source of information and we often will be able to provide you with some extra information that individuals who have applied directly to our company wouldn't have. Um, and what I also find useful is, in addition to reviewing the company's website as well as its social media profiles, is Googling the company and clicking on the news section of it. Um, it often gives you a great insight on the company's latest news or future plans that you basically wouldn't find on their website. Um, so once you will review all the information on the company, focus on yourself. So be able to explain how you can add value to the company instead of stating your expectations, especially at the initial, initial stages of, of your interview process. Uh, so make sure you ask, answer all questions clearly and in detail, giving specific examples and explaining what you have learned from previous experiences. So if your interviewer will ask you about your strength, uh, tell them what your strength is and back it up with proof of it. If you are not able to back it up, you may as well say anything. So for example, uh, you can say, I am a hard worker because I've exceeded my KPIs every quarter and I have been promoted twice in the past years uh, based on my performance. 
that's it. So when asked about your weakness, it's important not to choose weakness at random. Instead, make sure the one you select is not critical to the job. So for example, if you are going for a team lead position, you can't say that your leadership skills are bad. Um, so once you do pick your weakness, remember to highlight in your interview the ways how you are improving upon it. So let's say that lacking confidence is your weakness. What you could say is, um, I'm naturally shy, from school and into my early professional interactions, it prevented me from speaking up. So I decided to act on it and join an improv acting class. It really helped me with my confidence, dot. It basically shows that you are aware of your weakness and that you are working on it. So another thing that I would like to highlight is don't be afraid to say, I don't know. Uh, I had a chat with one of my candidates who was actually interviewing for, um, uh, for a pretty good position uh, with a global company based in Dublin. And she had 30 seconds to answer the question. Uh, and for one of the questions, she just ran out of things to talk about. So basically, she decided to stand still and not blink for 15 seconds, just to make it look like the video froze. Uh, I thought she was kidding at first, uh, but no, no, she wasn't. So I couldn't believe she has done it. But deep inside, I know that there are more people out there who would be able to do it, especially if they would be panicking. So if you are one of them, please don't do it. Don't do it because there's no need to. Um, so the VP of People Operations from Amazon, Arden Williams, as well as the CEO of Glassdoor, Robert Hoffman, and many other high positions uh, executives keep repeating that it is okay to say, I don't know. So no one has all the answers. Uh, and what's important is that you are trying to figure out what, um, what things you don't know. So instead of panicking during an interview or, prepare or pretending that the video froze, just stop for a second, think and say, I don't know how I would solve it, but here is how I would approach the problem. So as Robert Hoffman said, it shows that you are self-aware to know that you don't know and have the courage to admit it. So be honest, the interviewers are really appreciating it. I think when I was joining Berkeley, I did say, I don't know, to Paddy O'Connell if I didn't know the answer to it and I, and I got the job. So it is, it is working, I hope. Um, so last but not least is have a printout of your CV ready and your list of questions for your interviewer rather than looking at it on the screen because it may be pretty distracting. So in terms of questions, I would suggest asking for the career path your potential employer is offering you, uh, for the challenges that your department is facing, the culture of the company, the industry, and obviously some job specific questions. If you will have questions during an interview, don't be afraid to ask away. Um, interview, remember, it's a two-way conversation. So it will be even better if you would ask some questions because it would create a natural flow uh, to this conversation. Um, and what I would normally recommend my candidates as well is that if they feel confident, they can ask about the potential concerns that the interviewer has in relation to him or her in a particular position. So that will probably help them to rule out some of the concerns they could have with regards to their application in their stage. Um, so once the interview is finished, you can simply send an email thanking the interviewer for the time um, and for better explanation of the job. So according to account terms, 91% of employers like to receive follow-up thank you notes uh, so you can actually find some of the templates of it on our website. So this is it. Uh, this is it. I hope you found it useful. And if you will have any questions, as Louise said, our details are provided. So feel free to contact us. We'll be more than happy to help you. Or if you will need someone to prepare you for an interview, give us a call as well. We'll be, we'll be more than happy to do it. Um, so now we can come back to our guest speaker, Eric. Um, so Eric, you are a hiring manager yourself. So can you just tell us how are the face-to-face -face and remote interviews different and what interviewers are looking for in a candidate? Um, that's a good question. Uh, so I think, I mean, from my experience, I mean, I've been hiring people I think, on and off now for about 12 years. Um, so 
in a variety of different cultures. Uh, I think what's definitely missing from the remote interview is the, the sense of a whole person moves and how they interact and, and their body language a little bit because on the, on the remote interview or on the Skype interview, you get a very static and because the person's also trying to remain as still as possible, right? Um, I don't, in terms of the actual content of the interview, I think, I mean, you mentioned a while ago where it's attention to detail. Um, so things like, I don't know if you've mentioned uh, the microphone or the audio, for some reason I've become obsessed now with audio fidelity. Um, and I just think it's one of these things where buy yourself a decent microphone, um, because not only, as you mentioned, will we need it for the interview, but also for remote working, which is becoming more and more frequent and a decent camera. Um, I think if you have an external mic and external camera, it just make, for me, it makes everything a lot more pleasant and it removes that, that barrier, right? So you don't feel like you're talking to someone through a computer. And um, you kind of, you feel like you're actually there in the same room as you. Um, in terms of, so what, what was your second question? Uh, so, uh, so yeah, what are you looking for in a candidate while you're interviewing him? So in, for, for me personally, uh, I, I like to look at someone who's passionate about something. So I know there's a lot of these standard interview questions and they ask you about your weaknesses and your strengths. And, and they're a little, for me, they're a little bit generic. Um, I like to dig into the, the person themselves. And if, if they're passionate about something, it might be something related to IT or it might be something, it might be something around music. But uh, I just like to get a sense of, do I want to work with this person on a daily basis? If, if you know, things get tough or if things get difficult, will they react in a way that, you know, they won't freak out or they won't, you know, get stressed or they'll kind of, they'll, they'll have a certain mentality towards, um, towards the work. And I find if you can get someone talking about their passion, you get, you get a lot more about the type of person that they are rather than, you know, talking about these pre-prepared kind of generic, you know, what's your strengths and weaknesses and then they'll, they'll rattle off the weaknesses as being, I'm a perfectionist, which is ridiculous for me and I personally speaking, but, um, uh, and I just, I just think get, getting to the core of the person and what they're passionate about, because after all, like a lot of the job, especially if you're a graduate, um, a lot of the job you learn as you, as you go and you learn on, on, on the job essentially, right? We don't expect people to come in and know all the answers, but we do expect people to come in and be keen to learn be trustworthy, um, to, to pay attention to detail, to, to respect their appearance and, and the fact that like when they're on camera that if they, you know, they look, as you mentioned, dressing top and bottom um, and just be, just be attention to detail and, and, and you know, kind of, um, yeah, so I, as I said, I, I don't really, for me, the, the generic questions don't really apply. I really want to see that the person is someone I want to work with and connect with on a personal level. Yeah, yeah, no, I would, I would certainly agree with you, Eric. And uh, it's, it's funny that you, you keep mentioning this attention to detail. And you did even before we started, um, we went online. Eric was complaining about about the microphones and, and the cameras and so on. And normally people wouldn't really pay attention to it. But I'd say if you would have the same candidates with the same skills, the same experience, and one of them would actually have this camera sorted yeah. microphone and the internet, you would probably pick that candidate. Absolutely, so, because exactly. if they pay attention so to that detail, then they'll pay attention to other details. So it, it sends a good message in, in my opinion. Exactly, exactly, exactly. And, uh, and also, uh, it's funny that you have mentioned that, you know, it gives you a better insight to a person if you just ask them about, you know, their passion and so on. So. Is it also co connected to companies' culture? Because I've noticed it, I've not, I've noticed this increasing trend that sometimes culture matters more than than the actual technical skills. So, what yeah. is your take on it? Yeah, um, the culture. So the, I mean, the culture that we have is very much uh, everyone is their own man and woman, um, and you know, you don't, there isn't so much hand-holding done because we work in a very fast-paced environment. Um, we're not a startup, but we're not, you know, not much beyond a startup. Um, a lot of people do a lot of different roles. Um, people don't really say, this is not my job. We, we, we require a lot of flexibility. And, you know, sometimes we do things where, you know, we're like, we're not qualified to do this at all, but we, we give it a go and 
and we learn something about it. So, um, yeah. So that in terms of culture, that's that's definitely if if I was going to say culture, I'd say we we each person is almost their own uh, entrepreneur inside your organization. If that makes sense, and I think you need to think like uh, as if this was your business. How would you run it? And you need to bring that kind of mindset to the to the table um, and you need to challenge um, I like uh, to be honest I mean I know a lot of people will say they like being challenged but then when it comes their ego it takes a little bit of a hit um, but I, I like people who challenge I, in an interview someone challenged something I said and said like I think you should be doing it a different way and as long as they're able to articulate some sort of argument I'd be I'd be hiring that person there and then, you know what I mean? I'd be like, this is, this is exactly what I want to see. Yeah, yeah. And I really think that it's really up for the, uh, it's connected to the fact that your company encourages innovation, you know? Yeah. So it's important to actually know the company's culture as well. Uh, because if it would be more traditional, traditional culture with like specific mindset, maybe the hiring managers won't be as open to be questioned. Um, yeah. Exactly. And if you're a little bit of a, a rogue um, and you want to join the likes of, you know, certain big five companies who have a very established mindset and a very, as you mentioned, a very established culture, then maybe that's not the company for you. Maybe you need something a little bit more flexible and, and where you can make your own imprint. But to be honest, I mean, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a company for everyone. Uh, you know, some people like logging in, they like the process, they like the, um, the, the stability and, 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 you know, they like work to be work, and that's absolutely fine. Um, mm. I, I, I don't think work needs to be fun all the time. I think that's a that's a myth that we created. Um, but I think you need to you need to enjoy it. You need to get a sense of meaning from it. Like so, and that's that's different for everyone. Like, so I think definitely evaluate the company that you're that's that's in, on the other side. Evaluate the company that you're interviewing. Evaluate the people that you're talking to, and whether you would like to work with them as well, right? Because I mean, essentially, you're going to spend a lot of time with them, so you need to want, you need to like them and want to work with them. I think. Okay, okay, perfect. Thanks so much, Eric. So we can actually move move on to the Q and A. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had few few questions actually. So first question is from John Boyer. Uh, he basically asks, "Would you recommend getting an AWS certification and become proficient in cloud services, or focus on software security?" Um, so I'd say, Luis, that would be more in your area. Would you have yeah. any suggestions? Um, I suppose that there's two ways of looking at this, John. Um, I would recommend going down the AWS certification route. Um, while it is an investment in yourself, um, it would be very much so worth it further down the line. Um, I think we can see, obviously, now with everyone gone remote, um, a lot more companies are going to be investing in their cloud technologies. Um, while the certification will really stand to you, again, it's the hands-on experience, I suppose, is what most companies will be looking for. Um, but if you go down the AWS certification route, I would probably see that as being, what I suppose, a more infrastructure-related role that you may be in, um, instead of focusing on the software security. Two very different roles, um, I would certainly say, but having that certification on the cloud side will only add value to you further down the line. Um, so look, I'd, I would certainly look into it if I were you. I, I would recommend it is certainly very much so sought after as an up and coming technology on the market. Mm -hmm. I, I would agree on the AWS point. Um, we use AWS for our machine learning and unfortunately it's, it's so pervasive now that it's a little bit of a monopoly, but yeah, it's, it's definitely a, definitely a good thing to have. I think cost wise, um, if I look, I, if I remember correctly, it's about between three and three and a half thousand euro for the certification, but it might be a short term loss for a longer term gain because that really will add value to your CV and time. Um, and any company looking for those cloud skills will ultimately be paying for them in time. So try to get out ahead of, of the curve there and definitely get, get that certification under your belt sooner rather than later. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. I hope it answers your question, John. And if you will have more, if you would like to have more detailed answers, just feel free to email us and we'll be happy to help. Uh, then Nur, Nur, apologies, <laughs> Nurudin uh, just asked us to share uh, the mobile number um, and the number to our office. So it will be provided again on our websites or you can just email us directly and we'll be happy to schedule a call with you. Um, 
Then another anonymous attendee asked us if, uh, if you can do a test run for a remote interviewer with your recruiter. I would say certainly yes. It would be even encouraged. And what do you think, Luis? Yeah, I would certainly encourage it. You know, I, I would know my, myself if I was, I, it's probably quite honestly not something I would have thought about doing with someone, but obviously let's just say for a graduate level person or someone who maybe hasn't done one before, it's an excellent idea. And um, certainly something that I as a recruiter and, and I know any of our team here, like we would be more than happy to do anything like that to support and, and kind of do the test runs as such, um, just to test it and see, you know, about building that rapport and stuff. Because it, it is more, I, I would say personally, a little bit more of a challenge. Like I know it's people that I love meeting and I can build a rapport with easier. So, you know, I, I would probably recommend yes to that because um, it might just give you a couple of tips and tricks um, and look, any, any good recruiter who's there to support you will have no problem doing that. Oh, yes, certainly. And we can basically point out some of the mistakes or give you some of the suggestions that would help you to, to, to have your interview on point. Um, so question for Eric, what's your favorite interview question? I'm assuming this is a question I ask in an interview, right? <laughs> um, so I, I often ask like, uh, you know, who is Vanessa, who is Louise, right? Um, and it, it, it takes them back because they've got all these things prepared about you know, their job experience, what they've done, but like, who are you kind of thing. And, and it's just, I find it, it gives them a little bit of a, it gives them a little bit of a shock, um, but then they normally come back with something quite unique or, you know, they'll tell them something about their, themselves that they may not have on their CV or they, they may not volunteer uh, immediately. So it comes back to, again to getting down to what a person's passion in the room and saying, like, you know, who are you? Like, how, how would you describe yourself? Or um, those kind of questions, a little bit from left field, I think. Just and there's also that as well, I, I totally agree with you, Eric. Like, I, I think that that's something most companies ask more and more now is, who are you? Yeah. Um, you know, it's great to see someone actually doing a, a role, someone who knows technically what they're doing. But ultimately, if a company's hiring and their culture is a very focus point for them, bringing someone in who maybe doesn't fit that profile, but who can technically do a job can, can sometimes cause more trouble than, than you know, it's, it's actually sure. worth. Yeah. So, you know, I think it's a very, very important question for people to be prepared for. No, most of us know who we are, but when you're actually asked to summarize that, it can be a bit more of a challenge than you expect to get the right answer out or to, to get a, a, I suppose, a suitable answer out. So it's definitely one that people should consider having a little blurb on, them, on themselves ready to go. Oh, certainly, yeah. certainly. Almost every interviewer, every hiring manager is asking this question. So you can be certain that you're, you're going to be asked. <laughs> you need um, almost like your elevator pitch for, for yourself, yeah. I think. Yes, yeah. yeah. kind of, yeah. yeah, and also I'd like to point out that to be honest when you're elevating yourself. Don't oversell yourself either and don't focus on yourself too much because these are actually one of the common mistakes people are making. Uh, <laughs> So do try to sell, your, sell yourself, but not oversell. Um, so another question, what if the problem like audio or video issues at interviews, interviewers ends? It happened with me, but I couldn't highlight it to the interviewer. Um, okay, yeah. my main question would be, um, is it because you didn't have the interviewer's details or how did you actually get in touch with a certain company? Because normally we do know the email to the interviewer or at least the recruiter who could get in touch with the interviewer. So um, it's, a, it's an interesting one that you actually didn't have uh, the contact details to the person. Um, guys, would you have any suggestions? I think it might be, I suppose, more related potentially on that one to the connectivity issues. Like I know, obviously, um, Eric was mentioning about microphones and then cameras and stuff. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Okay. So Eric, I, I like it. Would you mind if someone highlighted that to you on your end if there was an issue? Absolutely not. Um, I think it's a good thing to 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 highlight as soon as possible because the worst thing is that if you get into a whole spiel and then someone says, "Yeah, yeah," I, yeah, I'd say Eric, even. Apologies, Louise. Um, I'd say even if you wouldn't have the time to do it right now or you wouldn't be able to do it because of the technical difficulties, it's important to follow up anyway, even, even if you would have to come back to them 20 minutes later or even one hour later. You know, it is important yeah. to follow up. I'm sure they would understand. 
that it wasn't your fault. These things are happening all the time, so uh, that should be fine. Um, another question, what kind of certification could you suggest to someone who has considerable experience, six years in IT project management, BA, uh, but isn't getting many interviews, even though the job descriptions look very, very uh, relevant? Okay, so what I can say is the BM market is pretty, pretty competitive. Uh, I'm working in the program management space and project management space. Uh, so I know that there are, there are many candidates out there. So what's important is to stand out. Uh, I'm not sure, Sarim, if you have uh, watched our first webinar when my colleagues were talking about being visible. Uh, if you haven't, I would suggest you to just have a look at our website because we did provide some exclusive content for, for people who actually had similar problem to you. Uh, and when it comes to project management certifications, is definitely I've noticed that the PMP cert and PRINCE2 uh, are a must nowadays. Normally, normally hiring managers are looking for it, so I would suggest you to do it uh, if you haven't. I know that some of the courses when it comes to the PRINCE2 cert, you, it, they can be done within four days. And if you already are a project manager, I'd say it would be pretty easy for you to complete it because it is an investment in yourself. So I would certainly recommend to do it. Um, yeah, I guess it helps in the search. When people are searching for candidates on LinkedIn, they'll look for certain keywords and as well, right? And part of them were like Prince2 and, and PMP and stuff like that. Okay, yeah, definitely. Um, so another question, I, I, I'm just checking the time or we're fine for time. Um, so do the panel think there will be more part-time or flexible hour types roles becoming available rather than full-time roles, allowing businesses the flexibility around costs and workforce? Eric, do you want to take that one? Yeah, I mean, I mean a little concern about flexibility around costs. Um, I think obviously you need to pay people properly, but um, I think definitely in terms of hours, uh, I know, for example, from my job, like we deal with the US and Europe, so you know, in terms of flexibility, as long as the outcomes are met and the targets are met, then I think uh, we're quite flexible in, in, in how we in how we kind of work. Um, so yeah, I think I think this this whole COVID thing is as as just destroyed the myth of you can't be productive working from home. So this is just another thing which I think when it comes to flexible hours, why not? You know, I think it'll it'll definitely yeah. change. I would, yeah, I'd say I would, I would agree with you, Eric. And once you are working remotely, you normally won't do nine to five, uh, nine to five shift anyway, um, because you may have some other responsibilities. You may have kids or something else to take, take care of. of. So uh, I'd say definitely, definitely companies are encouraging now more flexible hours arrangements uh, because because they are working remotely. If it would be in the office, obviously the hours won't be as flexible. But other than that, I think I think it is the future. Uh, I think it's changing everywhere. It was just a matter of time, and COVID just made it a little bit made it happening a little bit faster than expected. Um, okay, so uh, Alex is asking us: When you're looking for candidates, would you rather to see their day-to-day -day activities on their CV? LinkedIn profile, or do you search for, for specific accomplishments or KPIs? Louise, would you like to answer on that question? Sure. So I suppose looking at technical CVs um, day in and day out, I always kind of want to see the day-to-day -day activities. Um, especially, it depends, obviously, on the specific role that you're applying for. Um, but I would probably recommend having a lot of those day-to-day -day activities in your CV and on your LinkedIn. Um, sometimes LinkedIn is better for an overview. Um, I mean, I know this, it's great to have as much detail as you can up on LinkedIn, but a CV is typically what I would go off of, obviously. Um, you know, that's what's coming into me. That's what's going out to our client to represent a candidate. Um, so I will expect there to be a lot more detail in somebody's CV, um, including um, a technical table. So most candidates would have a technical table at the top of their CV, and I think that's incredibly important, especially today where there's so much technology out there. It just helps to represent what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. If it was a more sales-based role, of course, um, that would 
be more maybe KPI and figures results, you know, in, in your CV that would be more important. Um, but looking at it from a technical perspective, day-to-day -day activities would definitely be key and any project work that you might specifically be working on would be incredibly relevant. Um, Eric, you might have a different view on that though, looking at from maybe more business development standpoint, would you? Um, largely, I agree. Uh, I, would, I would always look at the day-to-day -day activities on a more, C, or more junior CV um, because I, I wouldn't have expected them to accomplish much in two years, you know. Uh, they might have. Uh, there's no reason why they wouldn't have. Um, but you're absolutely right when it comes to client delivery or, or sales, uh, you want to see that they've, they've accomplished KPIs, basically they've met targets or they've, they're used to handling big accounts um, because then it gives you a measure of you know, the type of person that they are and their, their, kind of, um, their temperament. So yeah, I know I would agree um, largely on that. I think for juniors, day-to-day -day activity is important, but look, for, for seniors and for more sales-based roles, I think KPIs are quite yeah. Yeah. And, up, and also you build up a lot of experience over the years and you don't want to be going listing of that 20 years of day-to-day -day activities. Yeah, the more relevant. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, especially if it's something from 20 years ago that maybe you started out, you know, you don't really need to, maybe just the overview of a title, the dates that you work somewhere is yeah. more relevant. I would always make sure your CV is very relevant to the role you're applying to and, and not yeah. just sort of rambling for the sake of it, of having stuff in there, you know, sometimes less is definitely yeah, yeah, I would say um, try to limit, you know, the, the, the CVs pages maybe to three or four maximum if you, if you have a lot of experience because the likelihood is uh, that the interviewers, they, they won't read it all anyway. Uh, so try to make it as specific as possible. And when it comes to the KPIs or, um, or the day-to-day -day activities listed on your CVs, I think it very much depends on the role. Um, but if you, can, if you can fit part of it in, in on your CV, Feel free to do so. Um, so, question for Eric: How do you present yourself not to be overqualified in a job interview? That's an interesting one. It's an interesting one. Uh, I have read that uh, when I was looking through the questions. But I, from my perspective, you you can't really be overqualified. I think it's always good to have brains in the room because you know you want to get the best people. You might not, you know, have a specific role for them at that point, but you know, I, I always think you want you want brains in the room and I, I don't think you can be overqualified. Now there are certain jobs and someone will point out that you can actually be overqualified maybe in accountancy or something like that. But again, that's not my, my area of expertise, but I've, I've always think if a person's smart, then you want them in your company um, because they'll, they'll figure out something that you don't know basically. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Uh, so Neil is saying sometimes you only have the recruiter contact details and an interviewer's name. Uh, name only, but not email or phone. Um, so I think if you are represented by a recruiter, it's his job. He's literally getting paid to have all the, to, to be ready, basically, whenever you have any issues. That's why I've mentioned um, in, in our webinar that recruiter normally should know when is your interview time. Um, so what I would suggest is basically stay in touch with the recruiter and just let him know as well, maybe one hour prior to your interview that you will be interviewer, that you will be interviewing. So just so he can stick around uh, before your interview in case of any, any technical difficulties. Okay, um, what else do we have here? Uh, uh, for someone really keen to move to Ireland to IT job, but finding it hard to be called for an interview, could it be having a UK mobile number on CV get the recruiters discouraged to offer interview? Louise, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, to be honest, it kind of depends on the, a couple of factors. So obviously at the moment there is restrictions on travel. So, you know, we do have to take that into consideration when we're sending candidate CVs to our clients. Like if we're fully aware, for example, that someone's relocating, they're going to have to go into two weeks of quarantine and we would fully encourage, obviously, to follow any government guidelines with regards to COVID and the approach to it. So we're fully aware of that being a factor. Um, visa status is probably another one. You know, if someone's coming and doesn't have a visa, it can take eight to 12 weeks regularly um, to get a working visa in Ireland. Um, unfortunately, that time is now extended even further due to, you know, I suppose, delays with COVID. 
So it's very, very difficult for us to be able to give someone support in terms of the visas, the process, if it's going to take, let's just say, three, four months for a, a, a working visa to actually come through. So while some of our clients might be open to candidates present in Ireland and actually you know, willing to support them to, to get their visa or whatever letters may be necessary, there is obviously a cost implication and a time implication now with both of those uh, situations. So if it is the case that you do need some, some visa support, for example, that is a big difficulty. Um, but look, it does depend on the companies. Um, some companies support it, some unfortunately just don't. Um, they, they take the talent that they can get within Europe, um, and I suppose quicker. So it really does depend. I wouldn't say it's the UK mobile number as such. I would just say it's, it's maybe dependent on, on that visa status and how quickly someone can actually relocate. Um, would be, I suppose, the two factors that I would probably look at initially. Um, Eric, I don't know, how would you look at that a little bit differently as was being 100% remote now? Uh, yeah, I, it wouldn't really discourage me um, from, from offering an interview, um, to be honest, because uh, obviously we're based in the UK and Ireland as well. So, uh, But I understand the sentiment in that it's like, uh, you know, this person's from the UK and it's a little bit of a hassle, but yeah, I think, look, it's nothing you can do about it. Unless you have an Irish mobile number, then you have to live with it, really. And um, unfortunately, you can't hide. There's no, there's no way around it. And so, yeah, so I, I get where she's coming from, but like, I think there's nothing you can do, really. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure if it would make any, any major difference either, because at the end of the day, uh, your hiring manager will know where exactly you're based. So that wouldn't make much of a difference. Um, Okay, so I have a question from Paul as well. Um, I have a blog which has a lot of good quality content on it. It's solutions oriented and site visitors can pull the code and it will resolve a specific problem from, for them. However, recruiters never ever highlight the blog before I go for interview. Any idea why that might be the case? Um, so I think, Paul, maybe, have you ever talked to a recruiter and actually said, guys, I do want you to highlight it? Because it may be the case that they aren't aware that, you know, your blog has such a good quality content on it. So the next time if I would be talking to a recruiter, I would actually highlight it in your conversation with him that, look, guys, I, I really want you to highlight it because I think it's, it's worth a while uh, for the hiring manager to, to go over it. Um, and another thing, I think you can elevate yourself during an interview. You can basically steer the conversation towards the fact that you do have this blog with good quality content. Uh, so what, what do you think about it, Louise? Yeah, look, I know recently I actually highlighted a blog that one of my candidates had done. Uh, it, it was very relevant, so I did highlight it and I sent it through to the client for review. Um, I think it just depends. Maybe it's a case of for first round interview, they don't want to overload a client maybe with detail. Um, you know, they, they'd like you to get in and I suppose sell yourself face to face or virtual to virtual um, to get started. So maybe that is just the case. Maybe at a later stage, they might highlight it. But you know, that's certainly a question I would ask just to be clear. Um, with, and you can also then in, in your interview, maybe make reference to it and be able to say, look, I can actually ask Louise, for example, that my recruiter to, to pass the detail over to you as, as they have it. So then, you know, at least you're getting it in there. But it does depend on a number of factors, I would say. But Eric, as a hiring manager, would it be something you would review for people? I'd be, I think it's an interesting, um, and it's a good thing to talk about in an interview as well. So I would like, I would like it highlighted, especially if it's relevant. Jeez, I mean, that, that would be, um, that'd be something to talk, because you can then ask them about it in the interview, they can describe how they went about setting it up, why they set it up, and, and um, yeah, I think it's a great thing. I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't see why you wouldn't highlight it. To be honest. Okay, um, perfect. Thanks. Time there now, guys. I was just going to say yeah. it. Uh, <laughs> just at two o'clock. So, uh, so uh, the last question maybe is like, how do you suggest building a network in Cork if you have relocated from UK to help finding IT roles in Cork? And once again, I can refer to the webinar, the guys have made uh, for IT Cork last week. So please come back to our website and, and you can find all the content in there. And I'd say we can just email you back um, the answers on all the other questions because I see there are plenty of more. Uh, so as I keep saying, feel free to contact us guys. We'll be very happy to help. And 
Thanks very much. Yeah, guys, thank you very much for joining. And Eric, thank you very much for, for joining as well. It's, it's been great to have your input. So thank you to everybody um, and, and have a nice rest of the day. And any questions, please go on to our, our website. You'll find all of our details and we're more than happy to, to speak with anybody that has any, any questions at all. Okay, perfect. Yeah, thank you, guys. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Thanks.